not on you, it's on God. He's the one teaching through you. So, so Doc Thompson, just so you know, I did just do it on the Google, and it is Epaphras. Huh? It is Epaphras. Epaphras. Right, we're going live now. Stress on the Thank you. Thank you, Facebook. Yeah, you can. I would just want live on Facebook. I'll meet myself in room. Um, I say good morning. My name is Clarice Thompson. I am a member of the Perkins Square Baptist Church. Um, this morning's lesson, we will be going into our summer quarters. Unit one experience and hope. Um, our lesson for today is hope in the Lord. Our lesson title is um, the glorious riches. Our text today will be coming from Colossians one verses twenty four to twenty nine, and chapter two verses one through um, three. Our key verse is Colossians two two and three. And it reads, my goal is that they may be encouraged in heart and united in love so that they may have the full riches of complete understanding in order that they may know the mystery of God, namely Christ, in whom um, are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. Let's have a word of prayer. Our Father and our God is once again, we come just to say thank you. We thank you for bringing us through another week. Thank you for bringing us through the highways and byways. We ask you, Father, that as I teach this morning, that Clarice will move out the way so that the Holy Spirit may be able to teach your people so that we may be able to hide your words in our hearts so we will not sin against thee. It is in the wonderful and matchless name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Again, I say good morning. <clears throat> Our devotional reading, I felt, was very uh, uh, important to uh, bringing out the, the theme of our lesson. So our, our uh, devotional reading is, uh, is coming from Galatians 3, verses 19 to 29. And what that uh, what these scriptures does is tells us the purpose of the law. So why was the law given? Paul gives us three answers. First, God gave the law because of Israel's transgressions. The sin produced the, the need for the law, which served as a means means of restraint. The law identified the actions that were contrary to God's will that would result in his wrath. Second, the law was set in place as a temporary measure. It was given until the seed to whom the promise was made would come. Paul has already said that his, this seed is um, Christ. God promises to bless all the nations through Abraham. Um, through, through Abraham has been fulfilled through Christ. Through faith in him, we receive the blessing of justification, a righteous standing before God, and the power for sanctification through the work of the Holy Spirit. Third, the law was uh, second class. God used both divine intermediaries, angels and a human uh, intermediary, Moses, to establish the law. But when it came to God's covenant with Abraham, God spoke his promises directly to the patriarchs. A mediator is used when two parties are involved. Such was the case with the law. God established the law and Israel was obligated to keep it. In the case of the Abrahamic um, covenant, though only one party was obligated, God, he alone will fulfill his promises. God doesn't work against himself. One simply has to understand what the law can do and what it cannot. People couldn't become righteous on the basis of the law because people are sinners. 
incapable of keeping it. The law can't empower sinners to obey. It can't give life. Instead, the law served the promises by helping prepare the way. It reveals God's righteous standards and imprisoned everyone under uh, sin's power so that people were positioned to receive the promise through faith in Jesus. The law is like a mirror. When you look in a mirror, it shows you you need to brush your hair, wash your face, and strengthen your straighten your clothes. But it can't do any of those things for you. The mirror shows your faults, but it can't fix them. That's what the law does for sinful people. It reveals our problem, our, our disobedience, but it can't enable us to obey. So in verse 27 to 29, Paul speaks of spiritual baptism, the baptism of the Holy Spirit, which is shared by all believers. Everyone who puts, uh, puts their faith in Christ is baptized into his body and clothed with his righteousness. So spiritual growth is the ongoing process of the Holy Spirit making our condition equal um, to our position. Paul is not saying that these um, distinctions cease to exist. He is saying that the that despite our human differences, we are all unified because we are one in Christ. No one is superior to anyone else before God. We all share equally in his relationship, in our relationship with him through Jesus. Since Christ is the true seed of Abraham, then those united with him by faith are heirs with Christ and by extension. Abraham's seed spiritually, since God still has a plan for the physical seed of Abraham. Oh, that's why it's so important to uh, always read your devotional. It gives you some uh, insight or some context as to where your lesson is going. Now, our, our unified principle, lesson principle for the day is that understand this, that physical or emotional suffering may cloud the heart and diminish hope for a brighter tomorrow. How might hope be restored? Paul rejoices in suffering for the faith as he shares the mystery of the gospel with Gentiles, which affirms Christ in them and the hope of glory. Think about that. Now, the lesson objectives for today. One, I pray that you will be able to comprehend Paul's message to the Colossians about hope in Christ transforming their lives or our lives. Two, initialize a vibrant and transforming hope. Three, express hope in Christ by sharing the gospel with others in word and in deed. In word and in deed. Now, the historical setting of the lesson, the lesson is a, um, a letter to the Colossians, is considered to be one of the prison epistles that Paul wrote during his imprisonment in Rome. Colossia was a small town in Asia Minor located a few miles south of Laodicea, a city that Paul also mentions in his letter. Today, this area is known as Turkey, yet the, at the time of the writing of this letter, it was the Asia Minor. Although Colossians' population was mainly Gentile, there was a large Jewish settlement present as well. Colossians' mixed population of Jews and Gentiles manifested itself both in the composition of the church and in the heresy that plagued it, which contained elements of both Jewish legalism, legal, legalism and pagan uh, mysticism. The church at Colossians began during Paul's three-year ministry in Ephesus. Um, you can um, check out Acts chapter 19. Paul was not the founder of Colossia. Ephesus was uh, uh, likely the one to start the uh, Colossian church when he returned home. 
Several years after the Colossian church was founded, a dangerous heresy arose to threaten it, one not identified with any historical system. Heresy is a belief or opinion contrary to the orthodox religion, especially Christian. Doc, um, Christian doctrine or opinion profoundly at odds with what is generally accepted. It contains elements of what later became known as Gnosticism, that God is good, but the matter is evil, that Jesus Christ was merely one of a series of emanations descending from God and being less than God, a belief that led them to deny his humanity. And that secret, higher knowledge about scripture was necessary for enlightenment and salvation. Colossian heresy also embraced aspects of Jewish legalism, the necessity of circumcision for salvation and observance of the ceremonial, ceremonial rituals of the Old Testament. Ephorus was so concerned about this um, hearsay, heresy, um, he made the long journey from Colossia to Rome, where Paul was a prisoner. While in prison, Paul heard that the Colossian Christians, who had once been exemplary examples of the faith and Christianity, had become vulnerable to the false teachers and deceptions. False teachers were threatening to undermine what the uh, what the uh, uh, efforts and Paul had taught them. Those erroneous implications threatened to remove the Church of Coloss from its strong Christian foundation. Paul, an apostle, caretaker, and steward of the Lord's Church knew that he was responsible for ensuring that the church was healthy, strong, and mature. So he wrote to refute the theological falsities and miseducation the Colossians were embracing. Paul was deeply, was Paul cared deeply that the church of Colossia understood God's love for them and their responsibility as believers. To do that, he reestablished that he, along with Ephesus, were two uh, messengers of God, and therefore the Colossians should listen to him. Paul, like an attorney, pleads his case to the Colossian believers, his motives and purpose, the, the mystery of God, and its impact on believers. Today's lesson lets us glimpse Paul's level of commitment to Christ. Now in Colossians 1 verses 24 to 29, Paul's motives and purpose. Paul begins this message by defending himself and cites his and cites his suffering for the church. Paul could have bragged about his many accomplishments, apostleship, or authority, but instead he focused his attention on his suffering. Even when writing this letter, it is believed that Paul was currently suffering as a prisoner of, of house arrest. This opening statement is counterculture because humans generally do not like to suffer. But Paul claims that he rejoices in his suffering. In fact, he believes that it is a privilege to suffer. The cause, his love for Christ and his mission was so worthy. It didn't matter to him how much suffering he went through. From this, his point of view, his suffering is nothing compared to Christ's suffering for the church. Paul challenges the validity of false teachers because they have not suffered for the church as he and Christ did. Paul is literally saying, literally saying listen to me because my suffering for the kingdom has giving me the right to speak and be a true messenger of the Lord. It is almost as if to say, if you're not suffering for the cause of Christ, then you're not following him closely enough. Jesus never promised an easy life for his believers. In fact, he promised the opposite. See Matthew 5 verses 10 and 12. 
Stewards of the Lord's church must be willing to suffer for the church. Jesus demonstrated for the church um, two ways of suffering. The first is redemptive suffering, which um, Christ did at Calvary for humanity. This is one, this is a once and for all suffering that was fulfilled by Jesus exclusively. The second type of suffering is related to the church and the ministry of Christ. This ongoing suffering invites followers and disciples of Christ to participate in, in, in it equally. Recall when Jesus told his disciples and followers, if anyone uh, would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. You can find that in Mark 8, verse 34. Now Christ's work on the cross paid for all sin, all sin. Paul wasn't suffering to cover any re remaining sin left behind. Instead, by sharing in the suffering of Jesus, we are more conformed to him and become more Christ-like. Rather than taking away the sins of the world, our suffering brings us closer to Jesus. Those who are followers of Christ are not immune to suffering, but are sure to suffer such difficulties like imprisonment, death, and other hardships. Paul suffered because he believed it to be one of the ministries God um, called him to undergo. His suffering in regard to the Colossians pertained to the difficulties he faced in attempting to persuade the Jewish believers to accept the Gentile converts. Paul then moved to share his purpose. In Colossians 1.28, Paul proclaimed Christ, admonishing and teaching everyone with wisdom. His focus is a Christ. Paul points out to points um, out how we must promote Christ. At the time of Paul's writing, the canon we know as the Holy Bible was not in existence. There was no recording of the life of Jesus, just the or oral tradition of proclaiming Christ from the apostles and other followers. The gospel was no longer a mystery because Christ revealed it to us through his words and actions, which were recorded in the Bible we have today. Paul's purpose is to share the wisdom of Christ with everyone that it preaches and teaches and his message centered on Christ over human and interpreted laws. The religious laws and rules of the day excluded the Gentiles. But the message of Christ was in, in, inclusive and focused on the love for all. Paul stated that God had commissioned him as a servant of God to the church, the church to present the word of God in its fullness. Paul viewed himself as a servant of Christ and the church. Paul was selected by the Almighty and his, his purpose and motives were to be a servant to present the word of God in its fullness to both Jews and Gentiles. He took this mission very seriously and held fast to his faith. Regardless of the challenges he faced, if we can demonstrate this kind of faithfulness throughout any trial, then we have the same reward waiting for us as Paul received the crown of life and eternity with Christ in heaven. I was telling the class last night, the other day when the verdict came down for uh, past President Trump, my, spirits, my spirit did not rejoice. My spirit was saddened. And the word came to me that he, if, he can, if God can save me, he can save Trump. That's how clear it came to me. So be we as believers, we need to be careful when when um verdicts like um or uh things come down in life like uh the other day with that verdict, be careful how we think about it. Even though I'm not going anywhere and asking for his autograph, okay, don't get me wrong. 
but it's how we think about things, okay? Just remember that. Now, Colossians 2, verses 1 and 3, concern for the Colossians. Both the Colossians and the, the, the Laodiceans were among those for whom Paul struggled so hard to bring them to maturity. We see in this verse that Paul has sent some of his people who founded the church. It was at Paul's direction. So in a sense, Paul did, uh, did start this church. Though we know Paul had not actually been with them in, in person because we see that they had not seen his face. The people who uh, worked with Paul had been trained by him and they were now working under his supervision. Now Colossians 2.2 2 could, could also be translated that their minds may be strengthened by being loving, instructed, um, and so obtain all the wealth of assurance that comes from Papa's proper spiritual understanding. Again, it goes right back to the mind, the mindset. More precisely, to obtain a mature knowledge of God's mystery about Christ, the Colossians' minds needed to be instructed in the truth to safeguard them against the circulation, circulating heresy. Paul was trying to do what he could to put them at ease by emphasizing the bond that should be between all believers in Christ. So the heart of man is what he really is. Therefore, whatever we believe in our hearts determine what we really are. So if we truly believe that Jesus is the son of God, then this should change how we live and interact with one another. So in one in, in the same vein, if a brother or sister in the Lord also has that same belief, then their background or upbringing or any other differences becomes irrelevant. All that matters is that we are both children of God. See Matthew 11, verse 25 and 27. One of the most important parts of our salvation is found in Romans 10 and 9 that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and shall believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. We not, may not fully understand how salvation is accomplished, and that's okay. We all must believe that Jesus paid the price for our salvation and that he rose from the dead. This must not be a surface confession. We must truly believe in our hearts. Christ then is the source from which all wisdom and knowledge come. Wisdom that we have, therefore, is a gift from God. The treasure of knowledge can be ours by the study of the Bible as the Holy Spirit reveals to us exactly what it is saying. See Proverbs 2 and 7. And it says that the Lord has a hidden storehouse a wisdom made accessible to his godly ones, meaning that he won't withhold wisdom from those who seek him. Any questions, comments, or concern? And I'm, I'm almost sure uh, Deacon Miller gonna have something to say about what I said about uh, Mr. Trump. But believers, let's not get hung up in what's right and what's wrong. The word says, Call upon the name of the Lord and thou shalt be saved. So if, like I said, if he can save me, he can save anybody. Now, a lesson conclusion before I um, hear from um, you all this morning. In today's lesson, Paul states that the goal of his letter is for the Colossians to know the mystery of God, which is Christ. Knowing about Christ and knowing Christ are two different things. Knowing about Christ is to know facts and information, which is not a much different than standard search it, um, searches we do on Google. Even demons know about Christ. See Acts 19 and um, 19, 15. 
But to know Christ means having a relationship and experiences with Christ. It is when our knowledge and information impact how we relate to God and others. Knowing Christ is transformative. If your life isn't transformed, then you don't truly know Jesus. When your life is changed through his saving grace, it doesn't stand to it doesn't stand to reason that you would keep living according to your prior lifestyle. If you really appreciate him for granting you this free salvation, it makes sense that you will respond by wanting to develop that relationship with him further. This looks like spending time in his uh, his word, praying, attending church services with fellow believers, experiencing community with um with your brothers and sisters in Christ. By participating in these things as well as, as others, you can really know Jesus and be changed from the inside out. My question to you this morning is, how can we remain faithful to the cause of Christianity when the world increasingly hate Christians? It's true that the world has become increasingly intolerant of Christians indeed, the same social uh, activists who are screaming for tolerance and equality are among the first to dismiss and condemn Christianity for being exclusive and outdated, etc. Sometimes it can feel like the only way to be accepted by our peers is to reject Christ and go along with the mainstream. However, this is not the life that Christ has, has called us to live. If we're uh, being persecuted for our faith, we can take that as a sign that we're living closely to Jesus. And that is the best place to be. Any questions, comments, or concerns? Thank you very much for your lesson. Can you Thank hear me? You. Yes, I can. Okay, but I uh, I take exception to to uh, to the former president. You know, I figure like this: God, going, I'm just gonna have to pray. I'm gonna ask God to forgive me for that one, because you know, like what he said. He said he said to buy Hillary, lock her up. I think we should say the same thing. Although I know it's not Christ-like, so I'm not supposed to say that, but I'm going to have to ask for his forgiveness on this one because he thinks he's above the law. He thinks he's fair, bro. <laughs> he thinks he's a gangster. I apologize. Mm -hmm. I'm going to step back into the Christ-like mode, but, oh, Lord. Amen. Oh. Uh, I, I, like I, I think that the, the whole, what I want you all to get out of this, you may not see what I see, but I know what I saw when it came, when the verdict came down. If God can save me, he can save anybody. Mm -hmm. But that doesn't, that doesn't condone what has happened and what is happening. His time is coming also, okay? Whether he go up or go down. Amen. But it's how we Amen. as believers see it. We have to see people from Christ's perspective. Okay? And, and hopefully... That's the end of the discussion. Let's get into the yes, lesson, y'all. Yes, thank you very much. I like to go back to the lesson. Um, <laughs> explain very well. I, I thank you. But for the new babes out there, um, I want people to know that this uh, assignment was um, not um, wasn't new to Paul. Because Paul had the same exact problem. As Colossians did, people follow him and teaching false doctrines. So he knew exactly what to say um, to the Colossians. And also, I want to bring up the fact for the, uh, for the new Christian is that because Paul was locked up, he was not being treated bad. He was not in a prison. He was like on a home arrest. And he still had the um, privileges to invite guests, preach 
the gospel, be able to write letters. His suffering, because he didn't finish his mission, his suffering, because he was still carrying a thorn in his side. So that was his suffering. His suffering was he was still being denied, even in Rome. Um, but um, he was new to this, so he knew exactly what to say um, to the brother who came to visit him, go back and teach his church. But it was a great lesson. Thank you. Thank you. All right, Joe. What makes you think I got something to say? Uh, on, on day, unless you got some crazy glue on your lips, I know you got something to say. I do got crazy glue. <laughs> so uh, I think it was a good lesson, uh, a lot of, of information. Um, there are some verses in that I like, you know, and, and I liked what you said, we have to see people through Christ. We shouldn't rejoice in someone else's suffer. Um, and uh, I really like that. Um, you know, one of the verses I like, I'm trying to get to it, where Paul talked about being a minister. And, you know, he says the dispensation of God. God has set him for that particular time to be a minister to the people at Colossae, uh, to the Colossian church, even though, you know, and until this year, uh, when I was in class, I didn't realize that Paul did not found the church at Colossians, that, that he had never been there. Um, so that was a surprise when I found out. So I really appreciate all the information that you brought. But Paul said it this way. He says, we preach one every man and teaching every man in all wisdom that we may be, uh, that we may present every man perfect in Christ Jesus. That's our job is to teach everybody the truth is to stand on the truth. Do not allow uh, our truth to be compromised by the conditions of the world. And, and that also means that when someone else is suffering, we don't rejoice in that suffering. We don't rejoice in their downfall, um, you know, because that's that's not Christ-like. We, we have to, to always show the love of Christ. And, and one thing that, that God has showed me over and over and over and over and over again is that Jesus always loved. And the greatest example of Christ's love is how he treated Judas, the one who would betray him with an act of love, the one who said he was with him, his treasure, his friend. Even though Jesus knew what he would do, he still treated him with love and dignity and respect. When he washed the disciples' feet, he included G Judas in that, you know. So our job is to present the truth. And 2 Timothy 2.15, we study to show ourselves approved, workmen that need not to be ashamed. God's going to judge us for what we did. Paul talked about receiving a crown. You know, you talked about that crown. If we live the way we're supposed to and do what we're supposed to do, then we will receive our crown in due time. Great lesson, a lot of information. Uh, we have to always show the love of Christ. And in, in 1 John, the fourth chapter, uh, there's a couple of verses in there. Uh, and, and one is that Jesus, that, that, that Jesus became the propitiation of our sins. In other words, he took our place. He took on our sin. And the Bible says in 1 John, the fourth chapter, it said, if, if, Christ did that for us. The least we can do is love one another. It concludes that chapter by saying that uh, that we have a commandment to love one another. But in verse 17 and 18, he says this, that as Christ is, so are we in the world. We are to demonstrate Christ in the world. Christ is not here in the world anymore. We are. And we are to demonstrate Christ in the world. It says, so as he is, so are we in the world. So if the church, the Christians, I won't say the church, I'm going to say if Christians want to make a difference in the world, then we always have to show the love of Christ in everything we do, <laughs> every way we react, and in everything we do. I like that verse, to whom, uh, you know, 
we will make known what is the riches of the glory and the mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you. Um, and, you know, we have to give people the word of God in everything we do. Great lesson. And we, we need to understand, too, that we are work in progress. Mm -hmm. Okay, Amen. so in the meantime, um, we just have to, uh, we don't all think alike, we don't look alike. But in the meantime, we have to pray in that and ask God for what we need in order for us to walk circumspectly before him. Mm -hmm. Okay. Hey, Dr. Clarice. Can we yes, show sir. him the love? Can we show him the love of Jesus and lock him up with one of his Trump Bibles? Well, whatever they do, whatever is done, we're not to glory in it. We ought to have compassion yes. and understand that he has a soul that can be saved and a soul that can be lost. We have to stop looking at it from a carnal perspective. We have to see it from Jesus' perspective. Amen. It takes time. It takes time. It, it takes, yes, it takes it, time. And not just time, it takes uh, a lot of time. You you, you have to be, uh, and the word I'm looking for, you have to be deliberate in it. Right. right. You know, because well, I always say this, right? I know the things that I've done. I know the things that I do, the things that I'm still doing that I suffer with. And if Christ died for me while I was yet a sinner, the word of God teaches me that he didn't die just for me. He died for everybody. And his intent is that everybody be saved. A lot of people have gone to prison and found Christ. Uh, but, you know, sometimes when we at our lowest, okay, that's when we see Christ, you know. So we have to always be mindful that Christ forgave us you know, and think about all the things that we have done. I can think of some of the things I've done that I'm too ashamed to tell anybody, but yet Jesus know, and yet Jesus forgives me. He so said he is just to forgive. And if Christ is just to forgive, then we have to be just to forgive. You know, I was thinking uh, this week earlier, you know, about forgiveness, because a lot of people have a hard time of forgiving and and we look at what he told the disciples about seven times seven. Mm -hmm. how, how much times, how many times, you know, because if I only had to give them seven times, I can keep track of that real easy. Okay. I can keep track of those seven times you 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 mess with me. And I can keep track of it that I can, you know, shake the dust off my feet, had nothing else to do with you. I don't have to forgive you no more. Jesus said, No, it's it's more than that. He said seven times seventy. Because most people, if you say seven times seven, they can't even tell you what the number is. You know, they got to get the pencil, the paper out, the calculators, and they got to add it up. And 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 that even goes back to the Old Testament, right? We 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 don't keep track of it because Jesus don't give track of it. You know, we sing the song that He throws it what in the sea of forgetfulness. He but... knows everything I've done, and not only does He know everything I've already done, He knows what I'm going to do in fifteen minutes. Yeah. 20 minutes, however long I live, he knows what I'm going to do. And he has already made provisions to forgive me. All I have to do is accept the gift. And if I judge one man because of his sin, then I got to judge every man because of their sin. And then I had to judge myself because of my sin. Mm -hmm. And, and if, I, if, if, if I glory in, in, in Minister Echo's downfall, you know, oh, he finally got what's due him. Then how can I show the love of Christ? Because I know what I'm what I'm do, the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life. The yes, gift I received that. So, so yes. we gotta understand too that remember now Paul was a persecutor of the Christians. He killed a lot of Christians. But I think mm -hmm. the reason that that um I felt the way I did when I heard. Um, verdict 34 was because I had did in an in-depth study of the word. When you do in uh, deep study in God's word, and Beverly, you all can tell, verify this, that you get some wisdom that you never thought about. 
It's like a turnaround. In other words, remember I mentioned the word transform. The yes. word will transform how you see things. See, so maybe this is a time that we we need transforming how we see things because the carnal can get you all bogged down and your hope, you don't have any hope. Mm -hmm. But when we have hope, remember what Jesse Jackson said? Said uh, when um uh, when he was running for the president presidency, he said, keep hope alive. Mm -hmm. And that's what we have to work. Where there is no vision, what? The people perish. Don't get bogged down with what somebody else is doing. Just make sure that, um, that we're not bogged down with stinking thinking and judgmental. Mm -hmm. We got to be very careful because Satan uses all those tools, okay, to blind us. But we pray and ask God to remove the blinders. And I know you want to say, yeah, he's a rotten man. He's a this and that and the other. That's neither here nor there. We are believers in the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. I was just going to um, add a little bit. Everybody said anything that I was going to bring up before, but oh, um, come on, say it again. I mean, we're we're forgiven as we forgive others. Um, don't let that that envy, that that hatred, stop you from having a relationship with Christ. Um, that that is sin. Anything that um, and any sin is going to prohibit you from getting close enough to Christ. Um, Christ wants to ha us to have his heart who can forgive all. Um, and Paul said himself, he, he called himself the chief of sinners. Um, Paul killed, he persecuted the church before Jesus came to him directly. Uh, he, he turned a full 360. Um, and that's the same, like we, we forgiven Paul because what he's done, he's, he's now up the foundation for so many churches. We're still, we're still, getting blessed by what Jesus did through his life. And that's the same in order for us to actually become more like him, we have to forgive as God forgives. And um, he's going to cast our sins as far as the east is from the west. Um, yeah, I, I do have my same mindset over the former president, but I know no matter what I think, God can do better. So if God feels the need to persecute him, for what he's done, we, we do reap what we sow, and we serve a righteous God. But he has to be willing to give his life to Christ before he is forgiven. Um, and the full, if you really have a relationship with Christ, it will show by the fruits that you bear. Um, I pray that the former president has a chance to get a relationship with Christ so he can bring all the people that follow him to Christ as well. Um, but it's why <laughs> he proclaims one thing, but lives the opposite. Um, and I, I pray that one day it'll be reversed. It'll be that he will actually live what he says that he believes. Um, and we got to make sure that we're, we're living how Jesus told us to live. Um, if we can't forgive this one man, how are we supposed to be forgiving ourselves? Um, we can't expect God to forgive. We can't expect God to give us all that he has in store for us if we haven't learned the lesson of forgiveness. Because um, everything is a lesson. You can't move to the next one until you've mastered this one. Um, and it's, it is, it is a, a trial. Forgiveness isn't a one-time shot. Um, every time it comes to mind, you should be forgiving again. Because um, I know if you've been really hurt, if you've really been, the people that hurt you the most are the ones that you allow into your heart. And once somebody has broken that heart, has broken that, taken that chip out of your heart, it's so hard to forgive. But I know a God that is a mender of the heart. He can bring any piece of the heart back together. He can make you whole again. And every time you that, that thought comes to mind, that that uh, that spirit of vengeance comes to mind, forgive him again. Because that's what God would do for you. He, he, he forgot everything that you've done 
he well, he has he knows what you have done. He knows what you're going to do, but he's forgiving you in spite of yourself. So that's what we got to do to everybody that we come in contact with. Because we're Think not the judge. Yeah, yeah, we're not the judge at all whatsoever. Um, From your calendar. We're not just Sunday morning. Keepers. Um, there's a difference. If you're a peacemaker, you do what has to be done to create that peace. Peacekeepers but just sit back and enjoy the roots of the, the work that the makers make. Um, but that's my word. Great lesson. I do really appreciate the lesson. Anytime we come to Colossian, it's this, um, it's a, it's always, always hits to the heart of what we should be doing on a regular basis. Thank you for your lesson. But think about it. Trump's helping you to grow. Yeah. There's a lesson there. Mm -hmm. See, you, know what? you know yeah. what? I pray I'm for it. I go ahead. I'm just going to pray for you. I'm going to pray for you. I'm going to pray for me. We, we going to pray. We can, we can pardon him. We can pardon him. We can show him grace by pardoning him. But he can't get away. Oh, none of us are going to get away. And, and then, too, he's probably going to get, he's going to win on appeal. He'll probably win this thing on appeal. He can't do any more than God allow. God is still in charge. You got to, you got to try to get him out of your mind, get him out and, and, and memorize scripture. There is no temptation taking you such that it's common to man, but God is faithful. Okay, so what we need to do is pray and ask God to give us a forgiving spirit in how we have been judgmental towards others. The most important thing is don't lose your peace. You do. You have to put on the whole armor of God, not just get him out of there, no matter what he's done. Think about some of the things you've done. Or I, I have to think about some things that I've done. But the thing that the key is Jesus paid the price for all of our sins. He didn't just take Trump, me, Joe, anybody and, and, and say, no, we got we, we got to think about whether we're going to forgive him. No matter. God died for all. Yeah. Yes, for man. all. And, he, and think about, go and read the history of Paul, what he did to the Christians. Yeah. Okay? He was there when Stephen was, was stoned to death. So all I'm saying to you is, let this mind be in you that is also in Christ Jesus. And all this tells us is that you're growing because you want to do the right, think the right thing like the rest of us. We may not be thinking right about him, Maybe thinking something different about somebody else. Whatever. Sin is sin, no matter. Mm -hmm. now, I want to read something uh, from 1 Timothy chapter 2. It said, I exhort thee, therefore, that first of all, supplications, prayers, intercession, giving up thanks be made for all men, for kings and for all that are in authority that we may lead a quiet and peaceful life in godliness and honesty. For this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior. In verse 4, who will have all men to be saved and to come unto the knowledge of the truth. For there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself a ransom for all to be testified in due time. That's from Paul. All right, I'm gonna have to go Amen. now. Amen. Everything gonna be fine, my brother. We Another understand. Another wonderful lesson. Yes, I'm gonna have to leave y'all now. I gotta pick up somebody this morning. God bless. Thank you for your lesson. Thank you, Bev. Yes. Minister yes. Beverly, I see them yes, curls, but I don't see you. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Very good lesson. Thank you, baby. This is the longest we done stayed on here. <laughs> yeah.
Well, um, yeah, I'm just going to um, announce next week's lesson. We're going to give it to my um, father to talk to our Heavenly Father to close us in, out in prayer. Um, Paul's le- next week's lesson is Bold minis- Ministers. Uh, the devotional reading is coming from Deuteronomy chapter 31, verses 1 through 8. The background scripture is going to be 2 Colossians chapter 3, verses 5 through 18. Go ahead. And give yep. Father, we're grateful today for all your blessings and mercies. We pray for our country. So much war and turmoil. We need your peace to guide our hearts. You said the last thing will be trials. But you said not for us to be upset. Worry about it. Because you are in control over everything. Amen. And for this, we say thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you. God, out comes of all the situations that are going on. Pray, oh God, that you put the person, the place you want over this country. And regardless of who runs it, we know you're in control. So we thank you for your blessings and mercies. We ask God, please grant our government wisdom. Pray, oh God, that you put the right people in the right place. Yes, so Lord. that laws may be placed in order. Yes, in order may take place. Pray, oh God, yes, for Lord. this violence that's going on in the city. Please, God, bring yes, solution. Lord. Bring help. Most of all, God, let your gospel go forth to change the heart of mankind. We yes, need the word of God to lives your people, God. Yes, Only Lord. the word of God can transform. We present all things to you that you say, heal, and deliver. And we ask all of yes. Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Walk with the guy. I'll see you guys uh, next time. Bless. God bless. All right. All right. I'll see hey, you later. Hey, Tony, I sent you a, a scripture to check out. You know what, man? I told you. I mean, excuse me. Uh, excuse me. Earlier today when we were talking, I, I, I suggested some things to you. And in front of these witnesses, I'm going to say you something else, man. You came up with a five-syllable word. I was thinking about that the other day. The propitiation. Propitiation. Man, I tell you, that, that word made me jump when I read it. Made me have to go look at it, look it up and find it. <laughs> but that's why I like First John, the fourth chapter, so much. Because of that one word. Yes. And I yes. asked the question, what's love got to do with it? It's got and, and, and 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 see, and that is how that's how you rose up from you know, preachers are made from deacons, you know that, right? <laughs> good good preachers come from from them dumb dumb deacons like you. Well, I'll yeah. just be a good deacon for now. For right. I, I, yeah, 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 yeah. I'm I like, no, 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 so I got to run. I'll be late for church, man. Hey, but just look, look, I, I will, <laughs> I can see this. I remember George Wallace, and I remember what happened to George Wallace, and he turned around. He turned, he turned around, around from being what he was to yeah. something else. Yeah, that's that shocked me. But yeah, he turned around. So, yes, sir. Yeah, it was a proponent yeah. for, the, for, the, for the black people. I yeah. can't believe now y'all got me praying for it. Oh. <laughs> Bye, man. Bye, I man. Y'all got me pr- praying for 45. Lord <laughs> have mercy. God that's bless y'all. The, that's the job title. Amen. Thank you, Joe. <laughs> All right. God bless. Have a nice